a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty an unholy license, your national greatness swelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. The denunciation of tyrants, brass fronted Indians. Your shouts of liberty and equality hollow mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, um, <laughs> piety and hypocrisy, a thin veil to cover up crimes which disgrace, which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. Yes, ma'am. Go where you may, search where you will, roam through all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world. Right. Travel through South America, search out every abuse, and when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of the everyday practices of this nation. Right. And you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without a rival. All right. Simplify clarify and illuminated the system on the which we live and the historical perspective he gave he gave was mind-blowing and i'll go so far as to say money back guarantee if you don't like it i personally would my would refund you your money money back guarantee personal 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 no <laughs> well, they'll have to give me a good reason why they're returning it. <laughs> that tells me the level of their consciousness. <laughs> no, but seriously, you must get part one. It is absolutely necessary. And we have to thank Dr. Lewis and his beautiful, wonderful wife, Sister Lewis, for all that they've done for us. For instance, this is the sister who arranges for Dr. Ben to speak. And over the years, this is the sister who made Dr. Ben available to us. So we have to thank her. Now, I know the sister is modest, like her husband, but they've done so much, they've contributed so much that we can never repay them. We can never even pay them. And to that, once again, I think we should thank them. Now, Dr. Dr. Lewis, who's Dr. Arthur Lewis? I mean, he is a doctor, he's a medical doctor, whose specialization is ophthalmology. But he's more than that, he's Dr. Ben's personal physician. He's the one who takes care of Dr. Ben. And, you know, I admire this brother. If you know Dr. Ben, trying to take care of Dr. Ben is like walking on thread. <laughs> across a river. And this brother is responsible for Dr. Ben's health, which is no easy exercise. And to be responsible for Dr. Ben and to be responsible to a family, it's, it's a work, ongoing work, and it's hard. And over the years, that's why I'm saying you, you have to get part one to hear what he had to say about Dr. Ben. I'm not going to repeat it. Right. So hopefully you get the tape. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we have to thank Dr. Lewis for all that he's done for Dr. Ben, all he's done for us. And the second part of this lecture, European World Economic Domination and its Impact on Africa and Africans, I think will give us the necessary background in understanding the plight we found ourselves in and what we have to do to get out. So with that as a background, I'll ask you to welcome back again our brother and warrior, Dr. Ackerlow.
I'll, I'll get it. No, I get it for you. It's okay. I get it. I get it. I get it. Just a minute. Very good, thank you. Okay, I thank uh, everyone and for the uh, wonderful gift, and I will wear it uh, with honor. What I want to do on part two is we're going to deal with the continuation of the IMF, but what I just want to do is to touch some of the areas of the world so that we can begin to see how the world is changing. And the IMF is just part of the change. So what I want to do is just touch two part portions on um, Africa, three, three short articles on Africa. Then I want to just deal with a little bit of America as it relates to the auto strike. Then we'll go into the IMF, and then we'll try to touch base to get a little bit additional picture of what is happening with Clinton and uh, China. And depending upon the time element, we can continue on into the uh, missiles and the nuclear energy. I have two handouts that I'd like to give you, and I'll give it to you in a short period of time. So I will try to present the material as quickly as possible so we can get it in. And I'm going to use some articles from different newspapers and journals just as an illustration to show you how the thinking is going in different parts of the world. And the first one, I'm going to they benefit from it. So just to give you a little touch that of the thinking of those countries. A brother asked me to identify some of those countries that made up the coalition that, uh, that was able to overthrow Mobutu and who are the, f the core countries that now control those natural resources and who have these regional conferences that Clinton ran to. And if you look at the map, basically they come from north down south is Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, Southern Sudan, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Malawi, of course the Congo, the brothers and sisters in the Congo. Then you'd think who was around them, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, and Angola. Those were the countries that put together their monies and their militaries to get rid of Mobutu. And that's why the United States and the West did not make any attempt at this point to rescue him because they knew the military force was too big and too strong. Just reminding you what the Angolans and Cubans had destroyed, a 100,000 man army of the South African, which was the best NATO can put. I want to touch on an article very quickly from Buchanan from the New York Post, June 27, 1998. And he's just giving you a little update on um, uh, this UAM strike, UAW strike. He says here, what's good for America is good for General Motors. And vice versa said this Mr. Eugene Charles Wilson told Congress in 1953. In 1950, General Motors employed more workers, paid the highest wages and the most taxes and had done more to win World War II than any other country, company. But what's good for General Motors may no longer be good for America. The title of the largest employer in the, in the United States has long passed to McDonald's and Kmart. General Motors is now the largest employer in Mexico. It is easy to see where Motown's future lies, south of the border. Since 1978, General Motors has built more than 50 plants in Mexico. Remember, the United States government bailed out Chrysler. And remember, the United States government gave Ford about $5 billion to upgrade plants in America. And Ford, what they, wanted to, what they did was they went to Korea, put the money there, and they hooked up and formed the company in Korea with the Kia, K-I-A. That's that Ford money. So you know where your tax monies have gone when it went to General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler. So General Motors have built more than 50 parts plants in Mexico since 1978, which today employs 72,000 workers, making it a part subsidiary of the Delphi Automotive Services, Mexico's largest private uh, employer. In Matamoros, thousands of Mexican workers earn one, two, or three dollars an hour, producing instrument panels and steering wheels for General Motors cars and trucks. The U.S. minimum wage is $40 an hour. The move to Mexico has become a target of the UAM charge that the General Motors is putting America last. Four years after the NAFTA, which is just the North, North American Treaty, is just the excuse to move things out. 
Four years after NAFTA, free trade agreement, lowered tariff barriers, these cities along the Mexican borders with Mexico, have hoped to, which hope to benefit from this NAFTA degree, have become more than glorious truck stops as they watch the manufacturing jobs go south by the tens of thousands. And basically what has happened is if you draw the border between Mexico here, and you know for every city in Texas or California, there's a, system, a city that is equivalent to it in the Mexican border. And the people in Mexico are working, and the people in the Texas and California are massively unemployed. Unemployment in the border town is higher than in Suarez. Two to three times higher than the U.S. average. So it's already at 15% already uh, depression levels for those people living along the Mexican border and the Texas border. Not only General Motors is making a new Motown in, in Mexico, Ford has 11 plants there. Chrysler now partnered with Mercedes will follow suit. Rival Volkswagen has already shuttered a U.S. plant in Pennsylvania and moved production to its new Beetle plant in Mexico. Mexico is rapidly becoming the hottest destination for auto production. Remember, automobile is the basic foundation industry of the country, one in five jobs dependent upon it. It is next door to the world's largest auto market, which is, of course, the United States. It offers wages that makes the workers cringe from Detroit to Stuttgart. Eight billion U.S. dollars have been invested in auto factories and plants in Mexico as a result of NAFTA in the last four years. Another eight billion is expected to be invested by the year 2000. So now you know where 16 billion of your tax dollars is going. Auto and truck export from Mexico to U.S. is 800,000 last year. It's going to a million this year. Volkswagen alone will produce 450,000 vehicles in Mexico in 1998, and Japan will follow suit. For what is happening is clear. All manufacturing that requires large pools of labor is going to leave America. U.S. workers cannot compete with Mexican who's earned one, two, and three dollars. No U.S. worker can live on that wage. An employer who tries to pay the U.S. worker that wage would be indicted for violating federal and state laws. Through NAFTA, we have guaranteed an endless hemorrhage, endless hemorrhaging of our manufacturing base out of the United States. As for the lower paying service jobs we keep, we have with, with an immigration policy that brings in millions of new people a year, guaranteeing an endless downward pressure on the wage of the native born. So after they move out the wages, they let the immigrants come in, who are going to work for much lower wage, and that's a pressure wage. So if you look at what is happening to America generally in the last 20 years, you can see a rapid decline of the material standard of living, wages and incomes, and you know they've already downsized medical care. Half the country has no medical care. So you're going to get the continuing downsizing that's occurring here, but you have to understand it in relation to the rest of the world. These things wouldn't be happening if Africa wasn't getting on its feet if China wasn't strong and other countries, so it's a reciprocal thing. Remember, 5% of the African race lives here. 95% lives outside the United States. Guaranteeing an English down with, okay, now we finish with the article. Not to worry, we are told, Americans will keep the high-tech jobs in Silicon Valley, but Bill Clinton and the Congress are trying to expand from 65,000 to 115,000 the annual influx of high-tech immigrants from China and India. Apparently, not enough Americans in the first world nation of America with six, 265 million people are qualified. In other words, you can't find all these people here to train them. Isn't that what we used to say to the black folks? So you give you a little bit. Now we're going to go and touch on the IMF and we're going to go into Indonesia. We're going to use the different highlights to illustrate some of what we had discussed the other day. And this is from the New York Times, and it says, Mr. Christoph wrote, whoever this person is, from the IMF. But a conspiracy, now we're in Indonesia. The economy has collapsed. Mr. Christoph wrote, but a conspiracy of far more potent subversiveness, capitalism, markets, and globalization. Mr. Suharto, the, the man who just stepped down, security forces, never figured out how to handcuff 
them or torture them in submission. His sophisticated military equipment can detect guerrillas in the jungle of East Timor at night, but it was unable to discern the bad loans or the proper but tumbling economy or currency. Under the pressure of economic crisis, ordinary Indonesians, students especially, lost the fear of the regime. Protests continued even after troops made the mistake of shooting. So they say to you, if they break your economy down, they will bring civil war to your country and break and destroy it. IMF, let's go on. Where's the crisis? The argument usually goes like this. So they're telling you the game, the IMF. Global currency markets now trade in excess of $2.5 trillion a day. They move the money back and forth. Billions more slush around in, to stock and bond market. This has created a huge electronic herd of traders. But when a herd this big stampedes, small and large countries that have opened up their economy to it can be crushed. Now you see why, in, why China, Vietnam, India, and now Africa will not become part of the system. Because if you hook in to with the stock and bond and all this other, they tell you they're going to crush you with it because you are playing the game. Super regulatory, therefore, the argument goes, the world needs some kind of super regulatory body that will control the capital markets and protect all these countries from wild stampedes of further crisis. The turmoil and pain in Indonesia are obviously tragic. They are the inevitable results, this civil war, the chaos, the breakdown of the country. You saw what happened in Indonesia, right? Killing people in the street, people are starving, they can't eat. This is a natural, this is the inevitable result of the country that got connected to the global market without sufficient rules of law, institution, building, or any fair division of the spoils. When market forces conclude that Indonesia's economic growth was unsustainable without more domestic reform, they stampede it. Somebody called in the credit card. Sure, all three of these countries, Indonesia, Thailand, and South Korea, have been hit by the global markets with pain, unemployment, and bankruptcy. So when Kabila in the Congo, Uganda, and Central Africa begin not to deal with these global markets and let the people begin to get the picks, axes, and shovels, they are doing like China did. They close the borders and let the people build a country. Therefore, you do not have these loans that you have to pay back. So when you see them not using the IMF, and you see them saying we're going to pick up the pickaxes and stuff, the same way they forced us to build a country to bring it to the point, they will come out, Africa will come out strong in 20, 30 years like China is strong because they won't be locked down in all this debt. So for now, this is the IMF telling you what you should be doing, but they forgot to tell these people this. But for now, the only choice is for countries to go more slowly in integrating with the global economy. So they're telling you, if you got any smarts, I wouldn't join this international loan shark racket we got going called the IMF and World Bank. For now, the only choice is for countries to go more slowly in integrating with the global economy while making sure that as they do, they are building the regulatory institutions at home needed to tap these electronic herds and to protect themselves. He's telling you, don't join it. You don't need them. Indonesia, they're going to tell you how they did it to Indonesia. But when Mr. Suharto pledged in a Samba television address in the nation today, this is the New York Times 5, 1998, that the, that to the nation today that he would step down from the office, the force that brought him to this point after 32 years was not a communist insurgency, but a conspiracy of far more potent sub, sub, subversiveness. They're telling you, capitalism, markets, and globalization brought him down and destroyed his country. Instead of hiding in the jungle, they established a fifth column. Who? The banks. The IMF and World Bank. They're telling you what they did to Indonesia and all of these countries. They. Who they? The capitalism, 
Markets, globalization, these money traders. Instead of, hi of hiding in the jungles, they established a fifth column in the glass and steel towers in the major cities. And Mr. Suharto's security forces never figured out how to handcuff them or bring them under submission. These forces, coming from the IMF is telling you, these forces set off the Asian financial crisis. They pulled the money from them to get what they have. And Mr. Suharto's armament was suddenly useless. His sophisticated military equipment could not be used. The turmoil here underscores the way that the financial crisis in the shaping Asian, shaping Asian politics and society as well as business. The crisis has, or this crisis has already helped usher in new governments. They break your government down into places in Thailand, South Korea, as well as help to assure the rise of China coming. Asian leaders are being forced to open up their economies and political system to break down the collusive link. So what they're just trying to do this in Africa with this trade bill because the Africans aren't going along with the scheme. So they got to try what you call trickery. Historic shifts now underway signify a, a landmark in the decline of the old order in Asia in a way that the popular uprising in 19, 1848 marked the eclipse, etc. Here is an article where they're pretty much saying that China is not going. China's entry into the World Trade Organization is unlikely. China has officially decided they're not joining the IMF. The World Trade Organization, the World Trade Organization, when they set it up in 1945, when the Europeans set up in 1945, the IMF and the World Bank. The difference is the IMF was an attempt to lend money to those countries that had wealth, like oil, Nigerian stuff, but the so-called real poor ones who didn't have, doesn't, don't have that ready wealth like diamonds and oil, you deal with the World Bank. So you'll find that the countries like Nigeria, who have tremendous wealth in oil, they may have known from the IMF. But another country like Angola, not Angola, like Mozambique, which is rich but do not have the diamonds and gold you can read, they usually get their loans from the World Bank. They're both international loan sharks. But in 1945, when they set it up, the, that agreement that those Europeans set up, the rules of international trade was called agreement of, a, a general agreement of tariff and trade set up all by America and Europe. Now this is no longer viable because the rules are outdated, it has changed. So they have now recreated the World Trade Organization. That's the new gap, the one we read last time where they're trying to force the Africans in. The same loan shark game, different name. But China says we're not joining it. We're not joining the IMF. So who's not in it? China, Vietnam, India is mostly out of it, Cuba, those Central Asian countries are formulating around uh, Iran and those other Muslim countries and the Central African countries. So they're dropping out. They're not buying into it. And so all it says is they're not coming in. Let us start on Clinton's China trip, so we get an idea. Is he begging? <laughs> and I'm going to read you the two central articles. The purpose is to bring you information, then we think, not for me to make the analysis for you. This is from the New York Times, fr Friday, June 26, 1998. And it's called China's Dynamism and Japan's Inertia. Now, what is happening in Asia? We thought, hey, we thought the Japanese were the big boys, or big whatever you call them. And they're talking again. President Clinton's trip to China should put a new vision of Asia into sharp focus. Remember what we said. The Africans are going to have to deal with the Asians. That's going to be your primary trading partner and your adversary. Europeans aren't going to be in the ball game. 50, 60, 70 years. So you got to know this to prepare. President Clinton's trip to China should, should put a new vision of Asia into sharp focus. One that, that all but formally recognized that the economic and geopolitical leader of the region is no longer Japan but China. We will see why. It's a shift that will also have a lasting and profound impact on the world's financial market. The shift in power was made especially clear this month when the U.S. decided to step in to try to stop the fall of the yen, but the emergence of China 
and the descent of Japan has been obvious. The Japanese dollar is dropping. It's almost like the other one. It has is the value has lost 50% of its value, and there's reasons for it which we will le learn about and talk about if we have the time. So Japanese is in the economy is in the free fall. Asian financial crisis is uh, Asian financial cri uh, crisis or not, China was moving ahead on the greatest economic reform and restructuring of the country. So you got to watch indicators of how countries develop. When you see Central Africa that has 200 million plus people and most of the world's natural resources begin to talk with each other and pool their armies and their politics and begin to build their road system, just begin to project what they're going to look like in 50 years. What you see China like now, it's going to be five Chinas. The contrast between Japan and China, Japan inertia, and China dynamism never seemed more dramatic than when the world watched the yen tumble in mid-June. The currency began to fall sharply after the revelation that Japanese economy, the world's second largest, had sunk by a surprising sharp annual rate is 5.3. And of course it has to because you can't have a strong economy perpetually going and improving while you're doing it on the backs of Asians, you're doing it on the backs of Africans. It's got to stop. Yeah. It's reaching the point. Devaluation of the currency was inevitable for Japanese economy that had lapsed into a new recession. So once when they start devaluating your money, your net worth is gone. You saw what they pulled the money out, devaluated Southeast Asia's money, and put a collapse in the Viet, uh, into uh, Thailand, uh, in uh, Indonesia and Korea because they had joined